numerous people who want to, the, the clippings from this uh, and, and we will post them on the website. I will hunk up the video and I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't have the chance to, to watch another 50 minutes of a webinar. So we're going to chunk it up into smaller pieces. Um, so what was going on with this survey? Well, key things, what is driving organisation? What's the volume of change like? Um, and I think, crucially, the reason that we have run this survey year in, year out is um, Jill and I were chairing the Change Management Institute in the UK uh, for about six, seven years. Um, we are the founders and chairs of the change capability community on LinkedIn. Um, it used to be called the Continuous Change Community, and there's several thousand members. And we meet every month to debate um, interesting ideas around change. And I think it was just making sure that we have the data to back up what often is shared anecdotally amongst all of us involved in change. But we know that in the boardroom, when we want to be taken more seriously, we need to be able to share facts and figures. And I think the last two points is change management perceived as delivering value, is change management supported by senior leaders. We wanted to know really if we are seen as a service and as a valuable service, because the issue is that if we are not a valuable service, we are an afterthought. And we are therefore invited into change initiatives long after the tangible change through the, the, the project teams has actually sort of started. And sometimes it's so late that all we are expected to do is to perhaps announce the change that's coming um, to those impacted. There's no chance to, to get their interest and support and get them participating. It's just an announcement. This is happening to you. And that's the danger, I think, if we're not recognised as a valuable service. So we wanted to make sure um, that we could we could see what was happening. So that's the reason for these survey questions. So, um, so let's start with a, a few of the basic questions that we had a look at, um, which was what's the, the most important reason for developing capability for change in our organisations now? Similar to last year, we will see that the, the top two are accelerate realization of benefits. So there is a perception that actually, if we're using change management, we are more likely to realize the benefits. We can invest everything we like in tangible change. So I can commission a new system. I can hire in management consultants for a new target operating model. But unless we partner that with effective change management, people will not change their ways of working. It won't become the new norm and therefore the organisation doesn't realise benefits. So hopefully that argument is now starting to become recognised. But what interested me was, um, as with last year, um, the second highest was ability to manage changing internal priorities. And as you can see down the bottom of this graph, that is a double the size of better respond to volatile market conditions. Now, the reason that catches my attention is that there are clearly volatile market conditions. There are changes all over the place. And in fact, in every CEO survey, and I track the global CEO surveys from all of the big consultancies every year, one of the biggest themes that comes out of there is volatility and uncertainty. And yet, when it comes to our changes, there is very much this internal focus. It's not we're responding to other things, but actually that we're tidying up what we've got inside. So it's the second year running that we've seen that it's all about the internal priorities. So that definitely catches my attention about the reason we're doing this. I think the other thing that really interests me this year is how reducing silo based working has come up um, to be much stronger than it was before. And it's overtaken um, any changes that we might be doing to improve staff welfare or reduce stress. So this also the reason I'm interested is that this sort of gives some statistics to what we're hearing, I think, as an overarching theme. Um, from an awful lot of, of, of courses that I run, but also the networking events we run at the um, change capability community, which is that there's a lot of pressure in the post-COVID hybrid is normal world. And there are still a lot of senior leaders who are railing against 
this idea of hybrid working, but it's with us and it's become the new norm. There was an HR um, get together in Arizona about a month ago where the heads of HR from very large number of global organizations basically came out and said, there is a recognition hybrid is now normal. And in fact, the what used to happen was that uh, in 1999, there were stats that basically said um, that the um, average working week uh, in the office um, was four and a half days. Uh, it's now two and a half days. So it's that recognition that that's become normalized. And we know from that, that silo based working has increased massively because if you're hybrid, it's hard enough, isn't it, to catch up with your own team, let alone trying to make connections and consider people in other parts of the organisation that you have no way really of connecting with other than emailing them or trying to get them on a call. But it's difficult to get people on a call when you've got no connection with them much harder because we're not in the office and we're not building some of those informal networks. So I'm not surprised by the fact that maybe there is a focus on, yeah, but how do we avoid this, this idea of silo-based working? I think what's interesting here about um, the types of changes we're doing, the two highest are the same as last year, down the bottom, increasing operational efficiencies and increasing digitization. And in fact, that's borne out by a lot of CEO surveys as well, where operational efficiency always used to be the highest. Um, digitization and the need to digitize and automate and streamline services that, you know, off the back of new digital tools is definitely a priority. So I'm not surprised by seeing those, but what we did do this year was we put in a new category, which is adopting artificial intelligence. And you can see um, at the second from the top, that's come in very, very strongly. What we also noticed last year, and it's the same this year, is that uh, things around um, supply chain, just don't seem to get anybody's attention. We thought last year that supply chain would because of the impact of the Ukrainian war. This year, it's still as low as it was last year. Um, sustainability has fallen back a bit though. Not quite as, as interested in that. It, when it comes to who uh, completed the surveys and which countries, what interested me was there were a couple of things. First of all, there are a lot of different people that completed the survey from last year. Um, not because the people that completed it last year didn't find it valuable, but as I was going around talking to people, they kept saying, oh yeah, I'll get to it, Mel, but I'm so, so busy. And that whole theme of busyness kept coming out. Um, the amount of pressure that people were under. A couple of other things that I really noticed, um, because I've made contact with a huge number of people who were doing this survey. And in the Middle East, um, unlike last year, uh, there were so many people that answered the survey that the Middle East came out as its own category. Last year, it was rolled into Asia. Um, much higher proportion of respondents from Africa this year. South America, again, there were so many respondents that it came out as its own area. In terms of the numbers from Australia and New Zealand, we saw a very strong um, lead from New Zealand in the change roles that are there, in, particularly in the public services and in utilities. When I was talking to a huge number of change professionals in India and across Asia, what was also interesting for me was the number of change roles that now exist. India last year was very, very low because I think a lot more of the outsourcing that goes on, um, those roles were based in other countries, more in um, the US and in Europe. But that is changing now. And there are a lot more people on the ground across India and uh, across Asia more generally who are taking responsibility for change. So I thought that was interesting in that these numbers about where people have come from, but also when I'm talking to everybody, um, we got a higher number of respondents, but it's just interesting to see where people are based and, and what the, the job market is uh, for change. 
Let me just talk a little bit about the question styles because there's some very interesting results here. Um, as with last year, we used exactly the same methodology, which is that we were using um, a neuroscience based approach. Um, we know that change is psychological and emotional. So to ask you to fill in a survey where you just rated things one to five each time, we just didn't think was useful. What we wanted to understand was how are people feeling and not just thinking. So when it comes to the thinking, what tends to happen is that we're answering questions because we, we think we have something in place. So perhaps we have a method, uh, perhaps we have a routine for that. Maybe somebody's responsible for that thing. And therefore we're going, yeah, I think that's happening. When it comes to feeling, it tends to be, yes, but am I noticing that there's a result from that? Am I noticing that that's actually happening? So the thinking tends to be, is there some kind of process or artifact or responsibility in place? The feeling is more a case of, yes, but is that working? Am I noticing it? Is it happening? And the thing is, we're going to end up with three different types of results. Where the thinking and the feeling scores are aligned, this really does give us a true picture. It means we don't really need to, to analyze anymore. We can look at the size of the score, the percentage, and sort of basically say, well, is that high enough? If not, take action. If what we're feeling is much higher than what we're thinking, this kind of cognitive dissonance, this kind of difference, is sort of, it's a warning sign clearly that something's out of alignment and that perhaps we feel something's being done well, but it's not reflected in our processes in our responsibilities, maybe in our measures. So there is something there we can go back and improve in terms of the, the structural approach to how it's being done. On the flip side, if you see scores where the feeling score is so much lower than the thinking score, then there may be things in place, but it's just not working. We have to go back and look at this is not having the impact. We don't feel it's genuinely working. Now, when there are big differences, we went back to the people who run the survey with us and we were talking about um, where do the feelings come from? And feelings come from the prevailing environment. But also that prevailing environment can amplify how we feel. So one of the things that we've noticed as a prevailing environment, because we're seeing this anecdotally, is that there is perhaps a more selfish approach in organisations than there was immediately post-COVID. So it's no longer the emphasis on how are you feeling? Are you OK? Are you coping? And bringing our whole selves to work. There is a much greater pressure now on efficiencies and reorganizing for efficiencies, however disturbing that may be to those people who are being reorganized. So I think there's a lot less emphasis on well-being, and I think you might see some of that in some of the scores that I'm about to go through. The dimensions that we used, these are effectively our critical success factors for effective change. And we did this as a collaborative group a couple of years ago where we were looking for all the things that needed to be included. So we aren't just looking at what approach we've got. Uh, we're also looking at whether or not the changes we have are aligned to our strategic objectives, uh, whether or not we have uh, pieces in place to support um, what we're doing, building capability, having resilience. Uh, do we look at how we adopt the changes and are we relatively quick at making decisions? Are we flexible with the agility? So those were the six sort of critical success areas that we put in place. So let me get on to the key results. So there's, there's some really interesting things. So in terms of what people are, are feeling, um, there were champion results, the highest results, uh, but I am going to go back and query them with you. But um, the skills for change management are known and respected is, is definitely one we're going to have a look at, along with changes are prioritised in my organisation and each change builds on the previous change. 
there's some interesting stuff there. I think what has strengthened is, I think you'll see some portfolio management, some prioritization activities seem to have got better over the last year. But where we need to perhaps draw more attention, um, reviewing the effectiveness of change activities, I think you're going to see that there is a theme around we're still not a mature service. We don't measure enough. We don't improve enough. We don't address lessons learned enough. The volume issue around the volume of change and our level of change being manageable is terrifyingly low. And that is certainly borne out by everybody I speak to. I speak to heads of change and transformation. I speak to heads of change management practice. I speak to change managers. And on the ground, I speak to a lot of line managers who are just baffled by how they are supposed to get the day job done at the same time that they've got to make so many changes to what's happening. So our level of change is manageable at 20% is not a surprise. It's terrifying, but it's not a surprise. What you will find, the leaders role modelling changes is an execrable 24%. That's really quite worrying because it kind of implies do as I say, not as I do, which is never a, a winning and encouraging way to get change to happen. Some of the things that were improved from 2022, um, again, we're going back to that skills for change management are known and respected. Um, so are we starting to win the argument? I mean, it came from a sort of a low base. Um, there is more support, we think, for those who are struggling to change. Um, and certainly, as I said, this emphasis on prioritisation of the changes is, is improving. But the leaders role modelling change, um, organisation believing managing change is important is going down and reviewing the effectiveness of our change activities, which wasn't high last year, seems to have got even worse this year. But again, it, perhaps it comes back to the fact that we are so busy that we don't have time to sort of say, well, how did that go? We're so busy moving on to the next one. But let's have a look at each of the dimensions in a bit more detail and you can start to see what I mean. If we have a look at the approach, as I said, my organisation believes managing change is important, is at 62% when we think about it, but only half of that when we, how we feel. And I think with such a big discrepancy, we need to ask ourselves why. And I thought when I was looking at it, I know that the thinking is that we, we perhaps have the artifacts, we have the processes, we have things in place. And so we did ask in the survey, you know, what elements of best practice has your organization implemented regarding change? And you can see the top two there is the recognition that change management is a skill and that there are a set of tools that people are using. And just underneath that one, not only tools, but we have a change management process. We have a change management framework. And I think the more that we do of that work, that we establish that there are tools, there are techniques, there is an approach that we can all follow the more we get that recognition that actually there's a skill associated with making change happen. So I think they, there is a virtuous circle there, certainly. Um, and there's quite a high percentage of, of those having a central sort of change management office, which is important. For, it's a focal point. And again, that office then owns the, the process or framework and it owns the set of tools. There's no assumption anywhere that having some kind of central office um, and a few sort of change professionals is enough to cope with the volume of change that we've got. But those change professionals can certainly be responsible for um, how we do change. So, you know, that explicit score, my concern is the implicit score is half of that. So my organisation believes change is important. We've got the artefacts in place, but maybe we're not winning the argument enough. And a lot of you tell me that, actually, in terms of have you got any materials, Mel, on how we can establish the value of change management? I was with a global group of change professionals, 200 of them in a big organisation, dialing in from all over the world last week. 
And the one question they wanted to cut across my presentation and just say, have you got any advice on how we can convince senior leaders that what we do is valuable? And we started to talk about how change management as a risk management activity is what captures their attention. And the fact that when we believe in change management is important, when we do change management well, we reduce the risk that they've spent money on tangible change but won't get the return on investment. But also we re reduce operational risk because when you introduce a change, you introduce risk to your operation, which they absolutely don't want. We are the, the mechanism that reduces that kind of risk, that there is chaos for the customers, that key members of staff leave because they're really not enjoying their working environment. We are a risk management function. And I think if we can start to get that message across more clearly, we'll be in a better position. Some of the other things in here, uh, as I said, we review the effectiveness of change management activities. Um, so 50%, we obviously think that we've got some processes for that, but less than two in 10 of us think that we really are doing this. And I think that's a, a key thing that we need to take out. If we want to be a valuable service, we need to apply the basics of continuous improvement to how we do things. But I think that's all about seeing ourselves as a service to the business. When it comes to capability, um, responsibility for change being shared between staff and managers. Well, there's certainly been some, some changes in the scores here in that um, this is sort of lower than it was before. And also senior leaders being held accountable for building change management skills, that's also lower than it was before. And when I followed up with a few people, though in terms of commentary, one of the things that has, has come out is that perhaps that managers are less involved in managing change and that actually people feel that they're just being left to get on with it and sort of get it done. And that also we'll, we'll see later on in terms of senior leader in, involvement. You'll see another score for that is much lower as well. So I think that's interesting that actually we're sort of thinking about staff have just got just get on with it. There's a change happening, just get on with it, make it happen. Um, down the bottom, this is the one that, uh, again, we want to sort of draw attention to. Skills for change management are known and respected. Are they? You know, um, I'm going to sort of draw up a, the, the next one here. There's a feeling that they are, that we who answered the survey feel that what we do is known and respected. But actually, we then go to, to some other questions that we ask. And actually, we're getting quite a high score on change management activities are not understood. So clearly, there's a there is an area here where we think that, you know, we know what we're doing, but maybe the rest of our organizations don't share that view. There isn't that sort of understanding or indeed interest in what we're doing couple of other barriers to effective change management, I really want to highlight the insufficient resource availability. And, and certainly that is coming across in every question, it's coming across in every comment that we get all the time is that people are just too busy to take our calls, they're too busy to come to workshops, they're too busy to come to demonstrations. People are not managing their current workload, they're overwhelmed. And then, and yet here we are trying to come along with even more activities for them to do. One of the biggest themes throughout 2023 with all the training that I do is how can we make what we ask people to do even smaller? How can we break what we're asking them to do down into tiny steps so that there's a chance that they might be able to fit it in to an incredibly busy week? And I don't see that that theme changing anytime soon and the insufficient resource availability is is a is a big concern here um along with insufficient senior leadership involvement again that's that's coming back out again and again that lead that whole thing about leaders role modeling change having sort of dropped through the floor to only 24 percent 
we see this in this other question as well. So I'm always interested in backing up the data with one with one question after another. Am I making sense so far? If anybody's got any observations or questions, just ask, interrupt me, or put things in the chat and I'll have a look at them. Making sense so far? Thumbs up if you're happy. Yeah. As I said, there's a lot of data, but there's a lot of things. And the, the whole point of this is for us to think about well, what is it that we can concentrate on? Where do we spend our time? Uh, I, I'm using this data to make a, a, I use it to make an argument for why change management is important in organizations, but I also use it to target my efforts. What is it that we can be focusing in on? And last year, I said an awful lot about how we need to work much more around portfolio management and prioritization. And it's interesting to see that we are, that there was a lot of response around that and, and we're starting to see those numbers climb up a bit, which is interesting. Here's something else. We put in two extra questions. We don't want to add questions to this every year uh, because otherwise it makes it harder for like for like comparison. But we did think that these were two very important ones um, because if I just go back here, um, insufficient resource availability and insufficient leadership involvement. Um, we have sufficient people to manage the volume of change. Um, a third of us approximately think that's true so clearly there is a big issue there um, we must rely on help from external parties to manage the change um, the thinking is that yeah we absolutely need to do that but the feeling is we don't want to do that the feeling is that we know that change has to be something that people do for themselves you can't, it, as soon as you start to hire external parties, you're into, it, it's great because you get that initial sort of, we've got people to help us. But the problem is that these are external to our organization and therefore we fall into the trap of actually we're doing change to our people. So it, I'm finding it really interesting, the conversations I'm having with senior leaders in this year, around how do we build the capability within our staff for managing change on the ground? So I think we're, there's a starting to be that realization that we can't cope with the amount of change that we've got. How do we sort of build the skills in people for them to be able to cope for themselves? Because clearly we have sufficient people to manage the volume of change. The only way you're gonna increase that score is if you keep upskilling them. I might be losing my voice, but later on today, I'm spending three and a half hours with a group of um, senior leaders within education who's, who are, want to upskill themselves in how do they cope with change. And they are not change professionals. They have no career in change management whatsoever, and they know nothing about change management. But I had exactly the same thing earlier this week. Monday afternoon, I spent my time with a whole group of people who are trying, they are the management team for a, for a big organization and they are responsible for implementing an entirely new uh, way of um, managing all of their documentation and all of their projects. And they wanted to know how can we make this happen for ourselves? So not relying on external parties and saying we're gonna do it for ourselves. And that's just, I mean, that's where I'm spending my time these days. And, and my time is spent in responding to client requests. And client requests are, how do we upskill people who are not change professionals? So I might run sort of uh, accredited courses for change professionals to get qualifications in change management. But actually the majority of my time now is spent in building the capability up around other people in the organization who are not change professionals. Because, and, and we've seen this coming out of the um, change capability uh, events that we run every week, uh, every month, that we are change professionals, but we're a, we're a small group and the volume of change is so huge that what we need is an army of people to be able to cope with the change. And how are we going to develop that? So that becomes a, a, a key sort of focal point in terms of, you know, where do we spend our efforts is if we and if we are the guardians of the tools, the techniques, the frameworks, that's great. But we need to sort of get it out to other people. Yeah. 
adoption, we wanted, um, as part of the critical success factors of any change, we have to be thinking, it's not that we're making change happen, but are we actually bedding it down? And so we have to look at, well, is the adoption actually happening? And there's a few sort of comments in here that I want to draw your attention to. Um, we are feeling that there is a, a link between the changes. Each change builds on the previous change. That's certainly higher than last year, um, quite considerably. Um, so we do think that perhaps, and that comes from more of portfolio management who are absolutely key conduit in aligning changes together and making sure that what we're doing is a cohesive picture and not just doing change after change that perhaps don't link together and don't therefore have the sort of multiplier effect of the benefits that they're creating. And I think that also goes back to something we have to watch for. If we have not got enough resources to manage all the change that we've got, we need to very carefully select the changes that we're doing and making sure that one change builds on the, the next change and that actually it, it aligns together, I think is something that it's that careful selection that becomes a, a very simple technique that can have an, an amazingly impactful, positive impact in terms of how people are coping with the volume of change. Again, less than half of us believe that we're measuring the benefits achieved from change. It's such a low score. How do we get the recognition that change management is valuable? How do we get ourselves respected as a valuable service if we don't do the basics of measuring what it is that we've achieved as a result of our change activities? I was working with a large engineering firm this year and we were talking about how impact is not just impact on disruption to processes and uh, disruption to responsibilities and who does what. Change is all about how people feel. The, the impact is it's how people feel. And I think there's something we could do about measuring not just the, the basic measures of has revenue gone up, have costs gone down, but we could do an awful lot more around measuring how people feel and whether or not we're measuring confidence and whether or not people feel a sense of empowerment. I know what I'm doing. I'm able to do it. So it's, a, it's that whole piece around um, do people feel they know what to do now that we've made the change? So I think some of our measures have to get into you know, how people are feeling as a result of the change. And we can therefore say, actually, from an engagement point of view, because we all have our annual staff engagement surveys, change management is making a significant contribution to that. So there's, a, I think there's a lot more work we could be doing on that. And again, 50%, we track how our people are feeling about the change. So half of us aren't. Um, and again, our people understand what is involved in behaviour change. But there's something in there about if we want to improve how people are feeling about change, explain to them exactly what's involved in managing change, because they are expected to self-manage. And it's very difficult to manage something that you don't actually understand. It's very difficult to feel confident and feel good about something when you have that level of uncertainty. So it, the key thing here is I think we, we need to be spending a lot more time on the explanation of what's involved and also tracking in terms of how people feel. When it comes to how do we actually measure, I think this is an interesting one in that I'm really encouraged by the fact that the leader is in the middle there. People adopt the new ways of working. So I think that is absolutely right. After all, um, it's the adoption leads to the benefits for the organisation as a whole. Change only happens if people are genuinely working in the new way. So it looks like that one as being the leader, we're, we're sort of winning that argument. Um, organisation is more productive, more successful. So yeah, are we making a positive difference and that delivers the value set out in the business case? So I think there's something in there around, if I had to pick any one of these, I would keep coming back to a simple measure 
for whether or not change is is working is whether or not change has been adopted because if the adoption rate is very low then the chances of actually achieving any more of the benefits of the organization being more productive or successful or any of the other benefits in the business case is going to be very, very poor. So we've got to keep on about the fact that are we checking adoption measures? And everybody I talk to, we come up against the same issues all the time, don't we? It's anecdotal often. What we need is we need to use our change agent networks to get into every single team meeting and try to track within every team. Well, how many of you are actually working in the new ways? And another follow up question that's always very interesting is how many of you are working in the new ways as you were trained to work? How many of you have started to tweak the new processes or change how you're using the system? So there is adoption and of the new ways of working, but sometimes that goes further in that they're adopting it, but adopting it in their own ways. I think both of those are valuable measures. The question is, it's quite, it's often very anecdotal and we have to get into probably every team meeting to get that kind of information. So it's worth thinking about how you might be doing that. And genuinely, are you doing it? And if not, what are you going to do about it? Resilience, as we said um, at the very beginning, the, the one that was very low this year is leaders are role modelling um, changes. Um, we're seeing a, a lot less of senior leadership involvement in change um, and the fact that you know only a quarter feel that their leaders are actually walking the talk. Um, so there's a lot more sort of do as I ask, but not um, perhaps do as I'm doing. Um, the people openly talk about the pressures of change uh, up to about two thirds that has grown from last year. Um, but it's still worrying that there, there's a genuine feeling that people don't feel empowered to get things done. What has increased here, though, um, which I think is encouraging, is because it was such an extrable score last year for we acknowledge and celebrate achievements because it was about two in 10 last year. And one of the things we said across the survey was this is a simple win, but a very important one that we congratulate, we acknowledge, we recognise when people have made a shift to new ways of working. But that actually is connected back to are we measuring whether or not people have adopted the change? So we need to be thinking if I just go back to we we always measure the benefits achieved from the change. We track how our people are feeling about the change. And this one here about people adopt the new ways of working. So I think there's a, there's a connection in here about, you know, if we're going to acknowledge and celebrate achievements, we first have to ask if there have been achievements. So I think we have to connect the dots there um, and definitely make sure that we're asking, you know, and finding out are people now working in the new way and making sure absolutely there's a celebration for that. In a lot of the work I do, yesterday, for example, I was in a session where I was basically saying at the beginning of your change, however late you are brought into the change initiative, when you start planning your change, you need to be thinking about your celebration strategy effectively reward strategy in fact the change capability community we actually did a piece on um the reward strategy um for when people have adopted change and uh, we did that a few months ago um if we don't have a strategy and if we don't think of it up front we're not costing it we're not putting it in the budget so if we're not and if we're not doing that, then we haven't got the and, and it might not always be money, but sometimes you want to have sort of um, fun award ceremonies. Um, I've I've done things where we've we've held um, breakfasts or lunches or dinners where senior leaders have been invited. And there's a lot of sort of shaking hands. And there's a lot of acknowledging and celebrating things. Um, I don't need that much money, but I do need to think about how I'm going to acknowledge and celebrate at the very beginning and get that signed off as part of my change plan. 
Manoj has asked about how do we sort of bed things down? How do we make sure that um, actually the change is becoming um, the norm? And I think, Manoj, that's a really interesting question in terms of sort of uh, the uh, adoption that we're looking at. One of the things that concerns me with the um, we don't have time for change. So those figures that are very low in terms of um, whether or not people feel that they have there are enough resources for change, whether or not people feel they have enough time to change, is that we have to keep nudging because people might make an initial move. I've got something at the moment where there's a platform launch and people have been very, very good at going in and starting to use the platform. And the feedback on it has been brilliant. But a few weeks in, we're starting to see a lot of people drop away. And when we're talking to them about that, it's purely the fact that they haven't, as you said, embedded it as their norm. It hasn't become the new habit yet and because they haven't practiced using it enough. They haven't brought it in enough. And because of that, because the pressure of work is because that's why they haven't practiced it enough. And because they don't practice it, they forget about it. And then it's almost like we have to start the change all over again. I'm doing a lot of work and I can almost see this is going to be a dominant theme for me in 2024, which is sort of almost the how do we build it in as a habit? So I, I do some of this work on some of my change courses about how do you get the new ways of working linked to what people are already spending their time on? I've got a classic example of this, Manoj, in my own team, where we're moving to use Trello. Um, and it's just for recording all of our, our projects. And there are some very good business reasons for doing it. We don't want to use our team meetings for sort of like for half the time, everybody going around saying what they're up to. Or spending lots and lots of emails where you've got ideas or you want to know, oh, has that finished yet? We're using Trello. There's a lovely picture on there, a nice Kanban board of what's in progress, what's being done, you know, so we can all take personal responsibility for seeing what we're all up to and we can cut all of that chit chat down. The thing is, I, I was going through this on a personal basis. I've got to make sure that using Trello has now become tied into my normal routine. And what I realized was that um, my normal routine is I always get myself a cup of tea first thing and then I open my emails. And if I want this change to become business as usual, what I've had to work out is actually I need to put opening Trello first, assess the project information. And then when I open my emails, I'm actually better informed. I don't have those sort of immediate reactions to the emails. So there's a, there's good business reason. But finding that hook, because I tried it the other way around and thought, oh, I must open Trello and I do that after the emails. But sometimes I forget. I'm realizing that actually, if I want this change to become the new norm, I have to sort of tie it into almost the things I do when I'm half asleep are so automatic. So I've made it the first thing now. But I think work like that, Manoj, is going to become yeah. the, the well, determining factor of us as change professionals. How do we help people do it? Thank you. It's really um, people are sort of talking more about the pressures of change. Um, the, the people feeling empowered to get things done is of a concern. Um, I think that being lower, that's certainly something that I wanted to, you know, what is it that we can do? to help people feel more empowered. The reason I'm so bothered about that being low of the empowerment score is we know that empowerment is, it's linked to that intrinsic motivation, that internal fire that we've got. Because if we don't feel that we can take our own decisions, if we don't feel we can get on and get things done, then where you know it, effectively all we do is respond to instructions and therefore we feel infantilized we don't feel in control of our own world therefore we have lower motivation so that empowerment goes directly to the heart of intrinsic motivation and a very simple thing is ask before you tell so I'm constantly saying to people, before you tell people um, exactly what it is you want them to do, why don't you put, you know, just change how you do things by 
proposing what you're planning to do and ask genuinely ask for feedback and genuinely get people involved in sort of planning and identifying activities and taking ownership so that empowerment one we mustn't forget goes to the heart of intrinsic motivation which powers any change really on the agility one the one that i um, immediately want to call out is that my organization number three my organization anticipates and plans for change I think that's that's incredibly scary um, that um, people just don't know that change is coming. What can we do in terms of, of getting people uh, more aware that change is coming? I think we, we must look to our portfolio management colleagues um, to make sure that we're constantly talking about what's coming up next, what's coming up next, so that we reduce the level of surprises. Um, the top one here, the cumulative workload of multiple changes is tracked, was also as low last year. Um, a four in 10 of us are doing that. That's that's appalling because we know that the volume of change is getting higher. If you if you don't track the cumulative effect, how do you know when a team is getting to breaking point? How, how are you planning to, to go live with the change, but actually that those same people are being impacted by four or five other changes at the same time. And actually we stand no chance of success. So there's something there where we absolutely have to link back to our portfolio management colleagues in terms of working these things out. I think that the whole thing we looked at earlier on about less than less than half, but it was growing in terms of the changes are being linked one follow on from the other. Um, this connects to the changes are assessed for interdependencies, duplications and emissions. Um, but again, how did we get to a point where my organisation anticipates and plans for change being 28%? How, how did we get to that point that, that, that actually the, we're anticipating and planning for change seems to be an afterthought? You know, there is there is clearly an argument we need to win there. But the changes are prioritised in my organisation and my organisation effectively optimises its change portfolio. They might be low, but they have gone up from last year. Um, and certainly the change that prioritised in my organisation was one of the bigger winners um, this year that has been a, a higher point so that's useful last ones I'm going to have a look at in terms of alignment um, as I said right there in the middle our level of change is manageable at 20 percent or only it, it, we think it's manageable in that we possibly got some planning going on so four in ten of us think it's manageable but 20 percent of us two in ten believe it's manageable I think that out of all of these factors, that's the one that I keep coming back to. Alongside one that has fallen lower and it wasn't high to begin with um, since last year, which is senior leaders know how to, res to sponsor change. I think those of us in change professional roles know that that has been a an issue uh, for, for a long time. But the fact that it's falling, and we also saw earlier on that senior leadership involvement in change is also falling. It's almost like we're leaving people to get on with the change. But one of the key things that builds momentum, that builds motivation for change is that staff feel that their leaders are supporting them, their leaders are involved in it, that their leaders are also role modeling it. Yeah. So there's something in there um, that we have to get more of our senior leaders engaged and involved. And I think making sure that when we're upskilling, when we're, and it might well be that this is more of a one-to-one -one conversation where we are sort of speaking truth to power, one of the most effective things we can do is provide and find simple analogies to ensure senior leaders know that what we're doing in terms of change is different to the tangible change that they're sponsoring. This for me cuts across all of this that if I can get senior leaders to recognize that you may be commissioning a new system, you may have commissioned a management consultancy to come in and restructure 
uh, you may have decided to acquire a new firm. These are all tangible changes. The behavioral change where people have to ad adopt new ways of working, learn to wake, work with new people, think about how their role has changed as a result of the new systems that are enterprise wide, that have automated a lot of, of information. Maybe they're using artificial intelligence. You know, all of those behavioral changes are different to tangible change. And I think the thing that we can concentrate on with senior leaders, is the one nugget that if it that pulls them into wanting to learn how to sponsor change is a recognition that, ooh, behavior change, that's actually a little bit more difficult. And I certainly speak to them an awful lot about the fact that the tangible change is effectively we're building the plane, but you've also got the responsibility to build the runway. Are people ready for this? Do people know that it's coming? Do people know what they have to do? People willing to make those changes? And some of the um, figures on here um, at less than 50%, people know that change is coming, people believe in the need for change, our level of change is manageable, would indicate that for sponsors, there are things that they will need to adjust if there is genuinely going to be a runway built to land all of the changes that they're commissioning. And that goes back to an earlier piece. Um, if I just go back, oh, I don't know what I've done there, so... I love my touch screen. <laughs> Does make things a little bit harder. Um, if we go back to the, the top one under agility, the cumulative workload of change is tracked. So again, uh, people just don't have the time to land all the change. So I think there are some simple messages we can give. We don't need big formal training courses. I think we can start some conversations with senior leaders, just opening their eyes to the fact that um, the things that we need to do in terms of preparing people for change is different to sponsoring tangible change, which is commissioning and spending money and tracking things are on time and on budget. This is much more about how people feel. Do they feel confident? Do they feel prepared? Do they feel knowledgeable about what's being asked of them? So I think something in there we've got to do. And I think Manoj has raised a, a, a point there about, you know, how do how do we get people coping? Um, I would say, Manoj, one of the most impactful things that I do is I get people to think about how each of the changes that are landing on their on their desks basically are linked together. How can you draw together your own sort of picture of pulling things together? If David raised a question about, you know, how do we make sure that change, you know, the percentage of change that is successful, um, we deliberately didn't ask that kind of question because it was, you know, we know that there's the the old adage about 70% of change initiatives fail. We wanted to look much more about are we capable of doing whatever change is coming? Um, and I think, though, some of the figures in here give us the what is it that we can do to improve whatever that percentage is, David, because we know that it's very low, that not all changes are fully adopted. So I think we have to focus in on, we need to help people cope with the change that's coming. How do they knit that into what they're already doing? So we need to make it much more of an incremental process for people. I know I'm coming to the end, so I will wrap up with this in terms of what is it that perhaps you can do. Well, share this recording with your colleagues, um, reflect on these results, identify what really resonated with you. What is it that you want to pick up? And I wouldn't pick up more than a couple of points and make those your sort of key objectives for 2024 and run it like any other change plan you know, identify those factors and then create a collaborative task force. So that's where sharing this recording with colleagues comes from, because, you know, you want to get other people on board and, and feeling the same way you do. Generate an action plan and track your progress. Do all the things that we're saying that maybe we're not as good at doing as we should be, is what I would suggest. Was that helpful? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for this. It's been a, it's been a, an interesting uh, one. Uh, it's really good questions in the chat, so I really appreciate it. Thank you.